Beep boop, intro music. Welcome to Cypher Sci-Fi, Explore How and Why. I'm Christopher Peterson. I'm Lee Colbert. And Josh is here. Josh from LSG Media. Dude, I'm psyched. Thanks for having me. And lucky me, get to talk about one of my favorite movies. Act like you're special, like everyone doesn't love aliens. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's so, it was very nice of you guys to, to save this one for me over the last 150 episodes. It's actually, this was one of those things where it was like, there's a list of obvious, really great, and not just like really good, we love them, but full of stuff to talk about movies. And I just, I didn't want to blow our load. And it's a good thing. I think we wanted to get good, too. It's a good point. You work out the kinks on Alien Covenant, and then you, then once you're like <laughs> just, just crushing it, then you come back to Aliens. And then we get to bring out Josh. You are maybe a familiar name from the end of the show where we list the supporters of the show. Thank you so much. Oh, dude, thanks for making the show. I hear you love Aliens, a movie with Marines in it. <laughs> so yes. you can identify. All right. So you know, we we kind of lost our format a little bit here because I was so excited to have Josh. Hey, Josh, what movie did we do? Uh, Aliens from 1986. Surprise. Spoiler alert. We're going to spoil the movie. What is Aliens about? Aliens. Aliens mostly, but like what else, I guess? It's about uh, more than one alien, unlike the original one. And uh, Ripley and a bunch of Marines that go to check it out and do a really, really good job and everything goes great. And almost everybody dies, but they kill a lot of shit in the interim. Yep. They kill a bunch of things, break a bunch of stuff, lose most of their people, and uh, eventually a couple of them get back home. This is one of the few times where the sequel was probably better than the original. I'd say uh, this and Terminator are like the two big ones in that discussion for me. And notice... Who directed these movies? Mr. Cameron. Superhero James Cameron. He's my favorite. So has all the money. It's been doing the shit. <laughs> he does have all the money now. But he deserves it for being so awesome. I got more to say on that later. I, this isn't... It sure sounds like it. This isn't a film podcast, per se. <laughs> like, you you know the show. We, we're not here to talk about the movie itself, usually. But sometimes it's so good, it's hard not to. I'll try to restrain myself, because that is my usual thing. It was really, and backwards-wise, it was really awkward for me on LSG, where I was like, I, uh, uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, we have to talk about like every scene that happens? Damn. And the, the characters? <laughs> what are we doing here? So uh, there's a movie, uh, what's going, what has first? So how does the movie open? This is good. This is, this is coming on the tails of the classic horror film, because it's what it is, right? It's a slasher movie. And it kind of starts off that way. Yeah. It's, it's silent, and then, oh my God, what's that noise? It's a door being cut open. And a drone. Finally, in a movie, they open up the derelict spaceship and are careful before they go in there. Instead of sending the captain and the entire like <laughs> command structure for first thing. Star Trek style. We don't know if this planet has breathable air, but we'll send down. Yeah. Yeah, it was kind of cool. They start with that, that cool drone with that weird little smoky. I don't know what that thing was supposed to be. Like that light that looks like there's smoke in it. Unless there's actually smoke in the cabin. I figure it was a dusty cabin. Okay. Case. In which case, I want to see the laser. They're scanning. It's a well, visual representation of it scanning the environment. Yeah. Oh. It's a LIDAR thing, I guess. Because we do see. How about this, by the way? Spoiler alert, maybe a little bit for the other Aliens movies. If we wind up touching on something. Because I'm going to mention that in Prometheus, they did use the LIDAR flying ball thing. It was further back in the timeline. But the very well equipped by the really rich guy equipment that they had was like a self propelling tiny LIDAR thing. So it makes sense that these blue collar like salvage dudes would have this giant chunky hulk of a robot doing the job instead yeah and then they actually go in there with like crazy protective gear on but the, uh, what gear uh it's well i thought it was like mop gear it's like it, it looks like a spacesuit but also that would be resistant to you know chemical biological and kind of threat that they might encounter in there because we know and they could probably tell from their their drone or readings that there's oxygen right i mean it's a breathable environment um but they are protected from anything that could happen like smart people would do getting onto a derelict spaceship actually that if you think about that these guys again they are just lowly blue collar salvage dudes they are doing all the right things to a degree they use the probe first they have this equipment that's protecting them in case something went wrong like what kind of stuff is making me wonder what kind of stuff could go wrong for a derelict spaceship like in this universe you don't expect there to be like murder aliens all over it so there's that 
But besides that, they are equipped for a lot of things that could go wrong, I guess. It's an interesting point. I don't know a ton about the whole expanded universe. I mean, I've seen a lot of the movies, but I do remember thinking the last time I saw Alien that when that facehugger jumps on that dude's face the first time, it's not that she seems... Ridley doesn't seem like wicked shocked that there's an alien on his face. She's like, you can't let him on here. The ship can be infected. There's a qu- We have to have a 24-hour quarantine. Not like... Oh my God! Aliens exist, and one of them's on your face. Oh right, yeah. She well, so. it's not. She might be shocked, but she has an answer for what do we do? Because even for not even the the salvaging dudes, but for her, what, they were like a shipping ship. Is that the word I want? What do you? Call it? <laughs> it's a shipping ship for shipping ships. <laughs> what do you call a ship? The ship stuff. The freighter or cargo. Or, I guess you ship. call it a ship. <laughs> like they were like a cargo <laughs> ship or whatever. So even they had procedures in place that someone with their head on their shoulders were like, oh, I know what to do. Step one, step two, step three. Lock them out the door or whatever. I guess in getting a piloting license, you get first contact procedures. Yeah. And it's like, don't go near it. Again, they're su- they might be surprised by this particular sort of alien, but it seems like they are ready for stuff to be weird out there in space, in, in interstellar space. Conversely, if you get a doctorate or if you're a scientist of some Kind apparently you disregard all of that if you, you watch <laughs> Prometheus. <laughs> Back to Prometheus, you lose all sense of anything that you should be doing. <laughs> and off the bat, an alien and aliens now, at least everyone is behaving reasonably, like Absolutely. in a world that needs to be safe. Yes. Just like when they see the multiple aliens, it's what should we do? We should leave and nuke the place. Yeah, let's it's get like, the out of here is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> let's not be here and make it all explode. It's a great idea. That's part of why these movies are so good, though, I think. They are like grounded, realistic, gritty, real people doing their job. That's the environment and the characters. Yeah, I know this isn't about Alien, but it does kind of carry over because the universe is all, it all is very dirty and gritty. And that's very unlike most sci-fi, especially up to this point where- Especially the time, right? What Everything was snazzy and sleek and metallic. And I don't know, what do you guys think? If you uh, were to look in the future, if we ever got to the point humans were actually traveling between- planets if not necessarily stars frequently like think uh do you have like dirty old freighters you weren't in the navy but i imagine that might be an indication i'm guessing you got on a boat at some point yeah yeah spick and span well usually yeah but they kind of have to be i mean i've been on civilian ships that weren't as good but it kind of depends on the crew though too like a good crew takes care of a ship no matter how old or how crappier it is because they depend on it for their livelihood and literally their life. So I would imagine same would probably go in space. But it looks kind of cooler when it's dirty and funky. And these are enterprises of mining. When you see an alien, and what does that do? Those are usually dirty and well-worn. At least lived in and utilitarian. Maybe that's even the distinction to make. Not dirty, necessarily, but like the world is not polished it is there to do a job these tools these are tools which i think again yeah it becomes a matter of economics and you either have it's a really low barrier to entry and just anyone has it so you have beat up crap flying around it's an investment so people take care of it even if it's lived in or there's rich people doing their own thing but everything we see is the military tends not to have like lots of money to spread on frivolous crap i would guess the marine dudes and then the shipping guys i'm sure they're working on a budget too and then you get the Nostromo. And you mentioned they seem to be prepared for a lot of different circumstances. You have no idea what's wrong with that ship. You see what? that it seems to have atmosphere once you've breached it, but why is it adrift? Oh, the ship what where they wrong? discover yes. Sigourney Weaver floating. Yep. Okay. So, spoiler for Alien a little, at the end of that movie, she got into orbit in that ship and blew the Alien out the airlock. And then yes. took a nap. Uh, yes, and extend it now, <laughs> well, I might say. <laughs> you do what you gotta do. 57 years, I think. Yeah, right. So she was in hypersleep, they call it. I want to say cryo, but they said hypersleep for 57 years. And that caused her some problems. Or no, they, they use that to explain her her grogginess, her weird dreams, blah, 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 coming out of that experience. And was this cryo sleep? Because that's what I want to say. it. Was this like a freezing situation, or is this mysterious unexplained other stasis i mean not, you don't really i don't think you can really tell right it doesn't show like it doesn't show her looking like a popsicle 
there's usually like all that gas always escapes whenever they open one of those little sleeping tubes, but I don't think you know. Um, and we don't really know how to freeze people, right? Like, except for Walt Disney's head, but we don't know how to do it, un- <laughs> undo-, undo it without everything breaking. Yes, well, problems with we know like how to water. freeze people, just not how to freeze you and not kill you. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, there's a big, there's a couple of distinctions to be made. That's very important. How can we put this to the temperature we need it without killing someone? Uh, or, or without making it so that all the cells are just burst from slow ice crystal formation. And the other thing is that we don't usually want to talking about this, but if we're talking about freezing, sublimation is an issue too over time, over long amounts of time. There had to be technology to deal with that that I don't think we ever hear about. Like ice cubes. Have you ever had ice cubes in a fridge? Well, in the fridge, I'll just turn to water. Have you ever had ice cubes in a freezer where they just kind of shrink to half size because you haven't looked at it in a couple months? Yeah. yeah. That'll happen. The ice can still evaporate, frozen as it is. And so what? you would see like a mummified little Sigourney Weaver curled up at the bottom of that I thing? would be very concerned after 57 <laughs> years. <laughs> like, oh, what kind of time periods do they usually deal with? For hypersleep? That might be the question, yeah. I don't think any clue is given. We have, since we've already sort of brought the later Prometheus and Covenant movies into the fold here, did those have time scales about travel? I think they might have. They... Don't that I recall, but we know they don't do fast and light travel, as far as I know, in the aliens universe, and yet they are going to other star systems. So you have to assume it's a while, right? So that just might be an inconsistency. Yeah, For like maybe. fifty-seven years. It's crazy. It's not because I, not I don't <laughs> think it's fast. It, I don't think it's FTL, but it's not too far away from light speed. But how okay. many? Because I think light we did that for away. Prometheus, and it was they got there really fast. Can you? Could you make a human like hibernate like a bear? Any way to do that? Yeah, you just got to shove a bunch of pine cones up your butt. <laughs> <laughs> Crawl in a cave. I, I presume that'll work, right? It takes some NyQuil, right? <laughs> <laughs> like a lot of them. Yeah. I mean, they got there have got to have been uh, like experiments, right? About hibernation? Sure. Uh, I mean, it's... How does it work? It states a metabolic uh, rate that you drop it down. Uh, or you can use drugs. So you do like an induced coma. They have to use drugs. But then <laughs> further on that point, what they can do is... Um, kind of pump a super chilled slurry through your body and, while keeping you oxygenated so that you go into a, a, a minimal metabolic re- state. This is not like, don't be this way for days. Oh, good call. But it's yeah. more, we need to operate on you and you're going to die. So we need to keep your body viable. Okay. And that mo- that that's awesome. I didn't think of that one, but that's also not going to be the hundreds of years or whatever that really no, would I mean, take to get you to. Can, Bring someone close to freezing, though, or drop mm-hmm. it for far enough down. We do it on the acute scale. There's no no reason in principle, I think, that it wouldn't work on the larger. And we do cryogenically preserve uh, biological specimens. I mean, we can freeze things, but they tend to be smaller. You can immerse it in uh, protective substances. All right, sperm. We get We get great results out of freezing and freezing sperm. Like, there's a lot of people in the world now who came from that process. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know there's like there's kinds of fish that literally in the winter they like burrow into the mud. This is this is not solid science. This is me remembering something I heard from a podcast. We're in they the same boat because I did not research this. I was not prepared. <laughs> they dig into the mud and their like their heartbeat slows down to like a beat a minute or two beats a minute, and they sit down there for the whole winter and then when the river or the lake thaws out they wake back up and they cruise up like i mean okay that sounds analogous to the chili slurry in your veins type situation. well actually it's a little bit different surprisingly it comes down to they dry themselves out first for the oh, most part you're familiar with the fish thing uh it happens in multiple different organisms where they'll go through or induce a state of vitrification for themselves Need, I need to know more about this word. Become a bit, they mummify themselves to a degree. <laughs> so they minimize the amount of moisture in their bodies before going into hibernation. Right, because moisture expanding into crystals in your tissues is the problem. For freezing. But then this also happens. These are frogs. And uh, it's to get through dry seasons, I, I think I recall. For these in particular, uh. they'll bury into the mud. Yeah, that might and be do it. This. And then when the rains come, they uh, rehydrate. Right. And it seems like they just come back alive. That's crazy. I had no idea. Uh, tardigrades will do this. Oh, when they well, go on that into, we got. Yeah. yeah, hibernative states. They expel a lot of their moisture. Uh, this is also true for things in the winter that would go through freezing. And does and, anybody know how the bear thing works? 
I imagine it's just a large amount of uh, fat stores and then reduced metabolic state. Because they just don't kind of move very much for yeah. the course of a couple months. You go yeah. lay in a hole. Yeah, none of these things seem to be shaping up as a good hypersleep alter, <laughs> a good hypersleep solution, except for maybe something with the freezing. Yeah, tough to find pine cones out there. On the <laughs> <laughs> Throwing around like plastic cups looking for... <laughs> I need <Maybe>. roughage. <laughs> you have dedicated artificial pine cones in the future. Oh, what are these for? You shove them up your butt before you go to sleep. <laughs> That's what they tell the new guy. <laughs> <laughs> so that still brings us to the 57 years. If that is a long time, we have to ignore the other movies because it, unless they're FTL, Prometheus went to not Alpha Centauri. And it would have been a very long ride. And this is a mundane technology, I guess, at least mostly in this world. These, all the things we're hanging out with here are agents of the corporation. Wayland Iwatani. Waylon Yutani. Yutani. Notice that, I'm trying to think of the other movies follow this, but notice that everything we see is corporate space travel. You actually brought this up in our pre-bit, that that was a thing. And I didn't think of it, but there's no example of anything else in this movie, and maybe not in the others either. Yeah, that's it. it I mean, the only exception is the military. They They are an actual, like, those aren't mercenaries employed by the corporation. Sure about that? Uh... Yes, because I'm such a nerd that I'm like, I wonder how their table of organization works, because I like that kind of thing. <laughs> Is that an <laughs> like, org chart for the military? Yeah, like how many guys in the squad? How many, you know, what's the section? What's the platoon? <clears throat> so I looked it up, and uh, apparently it is, it's the, uh, I think you see a patch at some point. It's United States Colonial Marine Corps. So the US CMC. Oh. oh, dear. Really? Yeah. They do mention governing bodies at one point, because like, oh, look, they're looking at this, you know, you blew up the ship. Ripley, and now we got we got to talk to basically like the space UN and the trade union or whatever. But that still didn't tell me that there were states that weren't the corporation, and I f- didn't realize. So those are actually marine marines, not yeah. a corporate owned thing. No, they're not. Although the fact that they're essentially on a corporate mission, yep, means that how much independence does the government really? Ha- you know, it, it could essentially be that the corporations essentially run the government bodies. I was thinking they might have been like a, a PMC, something that would get hired out. Maybe they were at one time, but... At their scale, they probably have their own, I figured. Like, that would just be their in-house ma- Marine Corps. Or, but maybe in the future, you, the government can just be like, hey, I need a, a squad to go check out this thing. Hey, our oil drill's broken. Can you send, like, two squads of Marines out there? <laughs> <laughs> we think there's, like, a mutant jellyfish. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> I love that there is corporate space stuff, though. Like, that means it doesn't take all the wealth of a dedicated, you know, state action to be doing this sort of thing, as much as they're as big as a state would have been. Still, it's, there are, I presume, other firms all involved in this sort of thing. That's cool that it's open that way. And it's sad that it's in the dystopian sort of corporate sense that you see from the late 70s, because that's, you know, that's where this came out of. We still have that in real life. It's still a problem. But that was when the movie started doing it. And it was that was a I mean that was crazy to think about and again yes it was very much of its time but the fact that a corporation is going to be exploring or settling in space and in 1986 at least right nobody was in the game except for governmental space oh, bodies right. and 79 was the first movie ish right yep yep and now now what like isn't uh aren't NASA astronauts about to ride up um on a new SpaceX rocket or something like that to the ISS yeah notice that's the government buying a rocket from a private firm. But still, there is a lot more going on. That's a good point. A lot more going on now than we might ever have imagined back then. It's a couple things. There are firms working on like space mining stuff and even the lowering from things like SpaceX, the lowering of the cost, the barrier to entry to get stuff into orbit. There's all kinds of firms working on like tiny sat stuff. Not even talking about space travel anymore. Just like we have access to space as a thing that a real person or a small corporation a small company that isn't nasa can actually do stuff with like we've talked about getting a tiny tube sat just because and what we could do with it because it's affordable it's like hundreds of dollars to put something in space but no big deal in this future they travel all the way to the settlement the the terraforming operation with the marines and drop them from orbit onto the planet 
Yeah. Sweet drop ship. Yeah, that, that ship that brought them there, um, that wouldn't theoretically, if you had a ship that would, you know, can go from system to system, it's not going to dip into a planet's like low enough into the planet's um orbit to be affected by gravity because that means you now have to use your own fuel and energy to get back out. Right? I think I think it would definitely be affected by gravity and I mean necessarily physics, but like I think the real thing is the atmosphere. Like if you're designing that vehicle, you're designing, let's presume, that the thing that goes from space to atmosphere is different from the thing that is designed to just to be huge in, in space. space, right? Yeah, because you can just have a, a cube if you wanted to, and that's perfect for space. Yeah, there's a lot of engineering considerations that go out the window when you just have to make it. Uh, you're worrying about it being pressurized, but you're not worrying about it being aerodynamic, which is a whole probably much easier thing now. So it definitely seems like they're ejected. Because that's the only thing that makes sense. I guess and then so you, hit, you hit atmosphere, and then instead of just deplaning, I have the a sweet like all terrain vehicle, just kitted out with explosives and armaments. Culver, you call it an ATV, but really that is like one of the least practical. Like, let's land on this rocky planet with this <laughs> four wheeled vehicle that's like four inches off the ground <laughs> clearance. That doesn't seem like a very practical vehicle to go onto. I don't know. Any alien planet you might find and not get s- super stuck on anything. Did well, it it's the future. So this is future engineering. They've obviously figured this out. And that is the optimal design. Well, uh, they the- do. They know where they're going, though. So keep that in mind. I don't think we saw it get stuck for what it's worth. But they uh, they know where they're going. So at least you'd hope that they're preparing for what they know the state of the place to be. But also, you think like the military, you're not going to design like, a, oh, this is our like super smooth planet vehicle. And then you have a, <laughs> you know, the, this is for glass planets, and then this is for rocky planets. This one with bigger wheels. Or Little tracks. do you know about the the just <laughs> pork projects in the future. Yeah, I was like, man, that looks like a, and there's no visibility. I'm like, that looks like a complete death trap that you're going to get hung up and either suck there until you run out of oxygen, or something's going to kill you. And this facility, this planet, is it a planet? I said planet. I, I'm, I just realized it could be a moon. It needs to be large enough to keep an atmosphere. Yeah, but the moon is just a relationship to well, no, what like, it's orbiting. You literally need a certain amount of mass and gravitational attraction in order to have an atmosphere. Right, right, right. It just gets pulled out. I agree. However, like... Well, you live in a crater. We, <laughs> I mean, there are only so many solutions to this. However, there could be an Earth-sized moon around a giant planet. The moon just means it's in orbit around... The larger body that isn't a sun. Is it a moon or is it a captured planetoid at that point? That might depend on its origin story then, I guess. This is complicated. Yes, because like Pluto not being a planet. Right. This is going to be one of those things that we're going to have to really work out. Like we already did once, right? Remember when Pluto wasn't a planet anymore? That was us realizing as we learned about more stuff. Like there's a lot of different types of stuff. This is too complex. What do we do? We have to take away Pluto and everyone's going to get mad at us. I can help you out with this, guys, actually. Um, moons absolutely can have their own atmosphere and systems and forests and Ewok villages. Um, <laughs> I know that for a fact. <laughs> no, oh, I forgot though. there's That's video true. evidence. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so what's that? I was wondering where he was going with this. But that's no, that's sound. It's all again. It's just its relationships to the thing it's orbiting, I think. But we're going to have to, when we get out there more, and maybe it's not during my lifetime, unfortunately, like we're just finding exoplanets, and even that's a stretch. So we don't have, we haven't had to deal with this level of classification yet, perhaps, where we're finding things that are in the gray area, like it wound up being with Pluto. We didn't know Pluto was in the gray area until we found a whole bunch of other objects out there. And now here we are, having been corrected by our now more informedness. So the terraforming, whatever this is, they're on a body, right? And well, and it doesn't have enough of an atmosphere. That's the problem, isn't it? This is a, temp- a terraforming operation. Which is just a backdrop, I guess. Do they actually talk about how it works at all? Do we know anything? Burke, the uh, Paul Reiser's character, he talks about it a little bit. He says like, "Oh yeah, it's uh, it's one of our," and he says it very dismissively, like it's they do this all the time. <clears throat> like it's oh, it's pop up colony. They call it shake and bake. You know, the cellists <laughs> go out there, they get these generators going. It takes you, you know, it takes a matter of decades, but then you get atmosphere. And he literally like, says it like they call it a shake and bake colony. Like it's that like commonplace. And it's that fast, too, which seems, even decades to me, sounds like super duper fast to make an atmosphere. And don't you also have to, like, to keep an atmosphere, you need the gravity, but don't you need, like, a uh, 
magnetic shield or something like that. The planet has to also want to kind of keep that so it doesn't get blasted by space space stuff. <laughs> well, there's a bunch of radiation that you have to concern yourself with. And yes, yeah, solar wind will strip away an atmosphere over time. But I'm talking about more about like Mars is a good issue with that because I hey, guess what? It's not geologically active anymore. And it is a bit smaller. And recent, unfor- did you hear about this? The recent unfortunate findings in the area of terraforming Mars. Maybe we weren't actually going to be doing this anyway, but it appears from study recently that the idea of terraforming Mars, where mostly it may have involved like nuke the poles and hope it just makes enough stuff, you know, or other operations that involve like putting out CO2 hard to try to make enough that there could be a greenhouse effect and it rolls downhill into an atmosphere. Uh, They did some math on as far as we know available CO2 and it seems like there's not nearly enough to do what we were talking about. This is semi-recent as of recording. So that's kind of a bummer. That doesn't eliminate all avenues to this. But for this one thing we're talking about in real life, maybe terraforming Mars, it, I want to say easy, but one of the more obvious ways to approach this seems like maybe it won't work, and that's kind of sad. Sorry, guys. Damn. We're not terraforming Mars soon. <laughs> so I found the concept of crater cities interesting. Okay, we'll be about. Just make a big old crater, and then those are the walls. And put a bubble. Yeah. You can just live inside of it. Actually, if they're big enough, you don't need the bubble. Good point. Yeah. Like the O'Neill cylinders, the giant spinning at the walls are tall enough in that design. You don't cap it off. It's just gravity. Well, in that case, uh, centrifugal force, but in the case of the hole, right, gravity. But that doesn't seem to be the case for here. No. <laughs> <laughs> Looks awful to live there. It's all gray and full of aliens. It's a frontier town. Well, uh, the aliens are a <laughs> special wrinkle on the situation, aren't they? Is it raining the whole time? Do you think that's part of the terraforming process? Like they're, you know, doing something and it's shaking up this whole planet because they, they can breathe, right? Like nobody's in a spacesuit the whole movie. So it, it's already terraformed a bit. Is that why? Oh, wait, you they're know, not. Oh, wow. Huh. Yeah, they just walk around outside. One thing to and consider, it, at least this might help us, is it might not be done yet, but we can breathe less than an atmosphere. When we talk about one atmosphere, we mean at sea level on Earth, but people breathe on top of Everest. Not it's going to take long, some doing. And then you die. It's going to take some doing. Typically. And well, still, don't go all the way up, but like you can breathe two thirds of Earth's atmosphere if you've adjusted to it. That's that's what they're breathing at base camp. People live there. So it could still be operating. It's doing temporary operations, it's trying to get to an atmosphere. There's a large window there where that can still be running while people can breathe it. Uh, it might not be comfortable. Probably want to get inside, but. Probably not great for running around with like 50 pound machine guns and battling aliens either. They mostly do that indoors though, right? <laughs> <laughs> True, but I don't think, uh, I'm not even sure, if, is that facility airtight? Is it sealed? Like it, it, it looks pretty beat up. Like it might just be blasted. I don't know. And aliens eating holes in the walls. Yeah, lots of alien holes, acid holes, whatever. And this is xenomorphs. Or is it? No, that is. Colbert was very hostile to this new concept. Because you're a dumb idiot. That's why. <laughs> because the internet's a dumb idiot. <laughs> because Chris is like, oh, diegetic. It's in the movie. How does the guy know? Hold on. But literally, they're called xenomorphs, and the other ones are called neomorphs. I need to introduce everyone to what may be a new idea to them. It was new to me, and I'm convinced now. I am now proselytizing that these aliens are not called xenomorphs. I am uh, with you, Chris. Haha. Did you know this already, or did you read the article? I, I had a debate about this uh, a while ago with somebody, and I was on Culver's side of things at the time. Like, Xenomorph is a Xenomorph, man. I know what a Xenomorph is. And I read an article. It might be the same one you're talking about, which made some really good arguments for why it's not. And it isn't. <laughs> there's, there's the, I, and I'm comfortable still calling them Xenomorphs because we're not actually in the universe of aliens right now, I hope. So we can call them whatever we want. That's but an LV223 facehugger. Oh, no. But in world <laughs> diegetically. <laughs> it doesn't have the same. I'm convinced. Here work. is the argument. So in the movie, the dude, the incompetent officer guy, that's the deal, right? It's like the Vietnam incompetent college educated schmuck who doesn't know how to work. He's in there showing off with big words, and he takes some Greek stuff and pushes it together into a portmanteau xenomorph. Indubitably. Because that's the only time in the, in the series, I want to say in the canon, if it's only movies, in the films, that's the only time anyone ever says that. The, the, the best evidence is that he says it before they physically see them. Exactly. And it's obvious from their encounter that they don't know what the heck these things are. 
And that guy, it's also clear, still he has no idea what he's talking about, and they have no idea what the aliens are. Despite talking about existence of the bug hunt, it sounds like they're just being flippant, and maybe there are other aliens. Maybe they're bugs, or maybe that's like a a way of communicating like futility in their operation or whatever. In any case, no one ever says Xenomorph again, and the only time someone does say it, they're talking out of their ass very clearly, because that guy has no idea what's up. However, <laughs> in the real world, not of the movie, they're called Xenomorphs. Oh, sure. So that's it. They're here to fight some aliens. They didn't know what was up, and that guy was dumb, but they get there, and now they have to fight some aliens. And they, at least, as opposed to Alien, where no one was ready and it was a stalker horror movie, in this case, we're ready to throw lots of bullets at them. Sure, you go from stalker horror to action movie. And it works pretty good, too. I like that they weren't invincible, you know? And that they have, like a bullet actually puts a hole in the thing. It's satisfying. It's the numbers that are the problem. It surprised me watching this, again, how effective the weapons were against the aliens. They kill a ton of them. There's just way, way, way too many. And they're in a terrible, terrible place to try to assault an unknown alien force. We, we often come up to this sort of question of why they're just in robots for everything where there's space stuff or there's the future. Why not just in robots? And in this case, we actually have robots... Oftentimes, we're like, well, the robots might not be able to do the on-the-ground, quick, by-the-minute, decision-making human stuff. But who cares? Get two bishops, send one of them down there. But it turns out, well, in this movie, they totally can. <laughs> <laughs> they totally could send robots. The real answer is we're trying to feed some people to aliens. So you wonder if those Marines are just like, they send ro- robots like everywhere. Why are they sending us? I'm very suspicious. <laughs> My warm, wet insides. Why do they want those? With the egg laying inside the creature, though, maybe they can just lay it in anything that's warm and alive. But I don't know if that's true, because you think the robots might actually be the, what do they call them? They call them robots? The synthetics. Those guys, like, they might be in the ballpark for that to work, maybe. They're not warm. That's revealed in the third movie. Oh, no? I assumed all the machinery would be warmish, but no? No, the synthetics don't show up, or they're ignored i think until they are aggressive I oh i think you're right okay yeah. good call i feel like i basically sort of remember that from the movie sometime uh it's been so long it makes sense that that would be a thing though and i guess if the robots are cold that's the part i forgot about they don't really address it in this one then that makes sense that they can't be uh impregnated as the humans and, would it's, be. Not, and it's not really clear if it's like is that actual i mean i guess it is organic material oh the robot it's hard to tell do we know much if about it's them nutritious here? or not well, we know when he gets ripped in half, it looks like organy inside. Yeah. It's not all ge- you know, looks like a big stew of milk and, and intestines. Doesn't look like gears and shit. Yeah, it's hard to tell if that's just a different sort of design biology. And for some reason, those fluids are milky. Like that's just what wound up being the engineering solution, you know? But it could otherwise be as biological, quote fingers, as the humans are, just by some other path. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. There's the consideration that this is the same universe as Blade Runner, because Ridley Scott said so, and it's also in the movies now, so I'm down with that, I guess. But like maybe there's something there where you have to assume there's some connection between them and the replicants, maybe, or the, or the events of Blade Runner, at least. Maybe that tells us something. Although, oh, I forgot. Those aren't robots. Well, it can be the argument. The Spoiler for Blade Runner. Form following the function, and that if you want to make synthetic creatures... And you want them to operate in most human conditions, make them like a human because everything's already designed for us. Exactly. They'll fit through our doorways, operate our equipment, use our tools. And we have methods like we can replicate our muscle strands to create actuators, artificial muscle, musculature. So you you can have a lot of the duplication in the look. He did say it's connected, but it also doesn't really make sense unless... This is way earlier because replicants literally can't be detected without like incredible okay. test or technology or luck. And yet all all you have to do with this dude is like poke him in the finger with a pin and see if milk comes out. <laughs> and <laughs> Which is like way easier than avoid contest. <laughs> all right. And fast. You can also we, ask him. We need to lay some stuff out. I guess. Well, here, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to use up this material in this Aliens episode, but this might be the right place because we already covered Blade Runner and Blade Runner 2049. We've mentioned the connection with Aliens, but we've not tried to flesh out how that connection actually uh, affects the things that are happening in the movie now that we know about it. 
if we're going to take it seriously, I think this might be the place. So we're going to have some spoilers for Blade Runner and maybe 2049 now as well. And the spoiler is, go listen to our Blade Runner episode. We spent a lot of time coming to the realization and justifying it that those are not robots. Like you're saying, you can't poke them and milk doesn't come out. At the end of the day, from everything we see, I mean, it depends where you poke them, I guess. The prostate. So you could... Do you have a milky prostate? You know, stuff happens. I don't know how yours works. And... <laughs> And so we spent a lot of time justifying that these are these are not robots in, in Blade Runner. Everybody calm down. We've got some points to make here. <laughs> We're about your prostates. <laughs> these are not robots. Are you guys done? <laughs> <laughs> That's just... Don't, uh, yeah, they're not robots. They're not robots. They are genetically designed humans that are being faced with racism and oppression because they're different. But they are human. Otherwise, the inability to detect them in the context of the first movie made no sense, ultimately. And in the second movie, in Blade Runner 2049, spoiler alert, they actually say that they are genetically designed humans. That might have been, the wording might have been a little tiny bit more ambiguous, but ultimately, I'm taking it as confirmation that we were right about Blade Runner. And then that other movie came out and was like, you're right, guys. And that's high awesome. Five. High five. High five. We high fived ourselves a lot. I high fived us a bunch on the show. Should have made them glow in the dark. But <laughs> that would be a good way to tell. Fucking your robots <laughs> trying to sneak. So yeah, in the world of Blade Runner and this movie, if you think of the replicants from Blade Runner as robots, then it makes little sense that there would be this step backwards uh, so that these robots now are like clearly detectable as robots when they could just be human equivalent. But one, they're not. They're better than humans in many regards for one. And two... If you actually consider the Blade Runner thing carefully, those are not robots. So this is a totally separate line of technological development that happens way in the future, a hundred years and a bit after Blade Runner, or that that we see the fruits of a hundred and a bit years after Blade Runner. Is there actually years given for any of it? Yeah, uh, there's guesswork to be made, but I think Blade Runner clearly sets itself up as a year. Twenty forty nine is in the title, of the one, and then Alien has outputs and stuff on the screens that tells you the time, the year. So it seems like it's actually there. Well, one thing that's common, both synthetics and replicants, like you said, are in some ways better than humans, right? As In terms of measurable, like Bishop is faster. He's physically like has better reflexes than a human. And being. he knows more. He's smarter by some measurement. Yeah. We've seen replicants that are physically more capable than regular humans. So that being said, you can do both those things. Why would you, if you can do either way, why would you design one to be undetectable from a, from a normal human and one to be very clearly internally different? They may have very different capabilities available by the technology that makes those synthetics. And also look at the events of Blade Runner 2049 and especially the anime that came out before, right? Was it beforehand they released those? They released yeah. a couple of short things and the one was an anime 15 minute short that showed the like the uprising the robots trying to have an uprising not the robots sorry see the replicants having an uprising attempt there was like a social upheaval because they were an oppressed class trying to fight back and when you look at that you might be like it's time to make a fucking milk robot like maybe that's just too much trouble <laughs> let's man. stop cloning people and lying to them yeah and, and just, just make a damn robot that knows it's a robot and then no one has to feel bad about it it's a good idea but maybe don't make them look identical to humans on the outside. Make them glow. Make them glow. Or like their faces are like upside down. <laughs> <laughs> it's creepy as shit. Like no one feels bad if you lose one because like, ugh, that guy. <laughs> Just even easier to no eyebrows. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Just take away the eyebrows. They're yeah. done. It's a shame milk robots. Maybe it is a really good SEO term. Maybe there's going to be like all this traffic and it's going to be. I'm going to find out there's some weird fetish. I know you're going to come robots. across, I think, people looking for commercial milk equipment <laughs> because you have milk robots for that. Oh, like, everything's uh, about cows. Everything's, yeah. <laughs> That's not porn. <laughs> <laughs> That's bullshit. Yeah, man. You got to ask a farmer. I can tell you all about milk robots. You want to get hooked up with a little, uh, little milk robot? Variable speed. Oh, wait. Remember the Japanese sperm donating robot machine? It's technically a robot. <laughs> I just realized that was a real thing. We saw this. Was that in the episode? I don't. I don't think we talked about it on the okay. show. But it was like a. <laughs> is it a sperm donating machine or is it a sperm receiving machine? That's uh, what I meant. 
It's a full pod. Just goes around. It's like a wacky waving inflatable arm flying tube man just shoots semen. No, I think a more aggressive like sounds of the lambs. Like you walk by, just <laughs> at you. An uncontrolled hose is better. Oh, so now we're like guar territory. <laughs> that seemed very impractical. And uh, and then a, and then a nuclear reactor explodes. Would you believe it? The fusion <laughs> reactor explodes like a nuclear reactor, which doesn't explode like that. Would theoretically a fusion explosion be any different? Well, oh, good it, question. It, we it don't have those yet, do we? Less like that because the failsafe should just be it turn it off. But like oh, right, you stop right. feeding it energy <laughs> for the process, and it just stops fusing. Right, because we have fission reactors now which have a certain mode of failure that is not so great. Well, it uses radioactive material, which if you have, depending on the design, it's you have to have a moderator. And if that fails, it just keeps emitting radiation. So you have a buildup of heat. And then if you have like a tsunami or whatever, there's all kinds of other complications with the water getting carried in and out. And so you have all these issues, but a fusion reactor wouldn't be doing that. The failure mode is basically it stops. I forgot. Yeah, that's how it goes. Yeah, because it should be a sustained reaction. Ha. Then you have to sustain it. So they envision this future where we have fusion reactors as energy, and it's like, oh, look at all this energy. Woo, we're going to terraform. But then they didn't realize that the way that would work, um, I, who knows? Maybe there's some engineering in the way they wind up actually working because we don't have any actually working yet. Uh, what we do, we don't have any actually working at a net benefit for energy. Maybe the thing that makes that work finally is something that makes it dangerous finally, you know, and then they explode. <laughs> like, do we still want it? Probably. Yes, just really far away. Just, yeah, put it on another planet or whatever. Perfect. Maybe the only way you can get a fusion reactor to work is to f- to fuse two nuclear bombs together. <laughs> <laughs> is that how it works? Oh, no. Yeah. Uh, and for some reason, that explodes. Everything fails. There's bullets and aliens. Who knows? Acid, right? Yeah, maybe a bullet hit the button. That you like hold down for the reactor, and you know the coolant got shot somehow, and it's and some, alien acid blood everywhere. Yeah, all kinds of problems that mixed in with the batteries, and so yeah, this, some kind of chain reaction explosion. Solution is, and batteries are a thing; they're dangerous too, right? In their own manner. Uh, so the thing is, you get in the ship, the robot picks you up last second, and you get the hell out of there into orbit where it's safe. The end. Except almost, except there was an alien queen. So there's an alien in their cargo hold, and they have a robot suit thing. There's got to be like, pew, zzz, pew, and punch it a lot, and drop it out of hole. Story of my life. <laughs> and then they're happy. That is a happy ending. I mean, almost everybody died, but like Reese made it. That girl's here. I'm going to count it. Happy ending. Uh, what do we learn? Uh... Don't ever let Lieutenant Gorman do anything ever again. If you're on an expedition to capture some aliens and a person that has survived them tells you to not do it, do what they say. Whoop de freaking do, Colbert. You learned that Xenomorphs aren't Xenomorphs. No, they are. <laughs> what did I learn, though? I learned, well, you know what? I don't think I consider the Blade Runner connection very deeply before now. And I think maybe the last time we had considered it, or I had considered it, we hadn't yet worked out that replicants aren't robots. So that makes this actually work, where these synthetics are the way they are. A lot to think about here. Man, this is a good movie. I didn't learn that just now. I knew that already. This movie's awesome. Bill Paxton's awesome. So is James Cameron. Space Marines. Aliens. That's it. Recommend related works. Okay. There's a video by Mike Hill called Jurassic World Jurassic Values. It was taken off of YouTube for a while, I guess because it's got a, like, you know, 90% of it is clips from the movie Jurassic World and the other 90% is aliens. That adds up, right? That probably got it taken down. But it's back now and it's awesome and I'm totally going to put this in the show notes and you guys both need to watch it too. Colbert, I may have shown this to you before before it got taken down. I'm not sure. It is a really intelligent comparison by this guy who loves James Cameron about why... Jurassic World com- about how bad Jurassic World is which is not only a bag I'm not here to criticize stuff but how bad it is when you put it next to a thing that follows a similar formula but is amazing which is Aliens 2 or not Aliens 2 which is Aliens the movie we just talked about this is such a good video and well you know also Josh here 
is on other podcasts. Oh, yeah. It'd be really cool if you listen to some of that stuff, too. Dean has been on the show. He's the main dude at LSG Media. And now we're happy to have Josh. And that would be at LibertyStreetGeek.net. That's it. Find all the stuff. There's the uh, Science Fiction Film Podcast is the main feed. And then there's a uh, bunch of sub feeds or different feeds for some of the TV shows we cover and whatnot. And uh, might be new stuff coming up. Like uh, like somebody else, we're toying with the idea of maybe doing a uh, an actual play role-playing podcast. So that's kind of in the works as well. They saw us talking about a really good idea. And they thought, why not rip that off? <laughs> Quick. Release before them. We should, I hope. Because I already have the one recorded. So we're kind of a step ahead at this point. Suckers. <laughs> but yeah, Josh's show, you're on Science Fiction Film Podcast, the main show, uh, sometimes. And then you're on the X-Files show all the time. All the time. And Josh is cool. So you should totally listen to Josh talk about some stuff. And then this. This thing, too. Go ahead. Uh, oh, yeah. If you've, uh, if anybody is in the southeastern Massachusetts area, if you're going through uh, anywhere about a half hour from Providence, hour from Boston, I have an escape room called Mass Escape. Uh, started a year ago with a couple friends, and uh, it totally kicks ass. Um, we got great reviews. A lot of people say it's uh, the best they've ever done. People that have done a hundred or more escape rooms are really proud of it. Working on a new room, so that'd be cool if you check that out. Mass Escape, MassEscapeRoom dot com. Mass Escape. You know what? I've been keeping an eye on this thing because this guy I know online runs it, and it does look like it's actually legit awesome. And also, I've been seeing the Facebook activity where people all in one breath for some reason, where all the people seem to really enjoy it. So probably do that. And if I'm in the area, I will as well. Dude, thanks so much for asking, both of you guys. It was a blast. I have uh, always learned a lot and been entertained by the show. And um, big fan of uh, what you guys do and supporting your creators and shit on the internet and other places. <laughs> but especially the especially the internet. I really appreciated you actually uh, getting in on that, man. That's awesome. And thanks for finally coming on. And there is a bunch of other people who have done the same thing. And we should give them their due. They're Joe Ferraro, Daniel the Ant Blonder, Jeremy the Top Poster, Armored Attack Room Gideon Roos, Adrian Mahela, Dinosaur Hunter, Alan Michael Pools, Prostate Milking Superman, Robert the Roaster, Dean at LSD Media, you might have heard him before, Andy P at Bash 25 Comics, Brian the Sexiest Brother Peterson, Peter Van the Dutchman, Andrew Capitula of the Mighty, Jeff Farmish Warman, Chris Ovopositor, <laughs> Nipples Gennard. Think how frightening that would be. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And Michael, the Giantess Peterson, Samuel Mumbry, Igor Smolinski, Josh F and G, this guy, he's great. Hello, Josh. Yo. Thank you for giving us money. Hey. I now we'll stop. Now that we're <laughs> it paid off. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent ruse. Uh Mr. Raygun Curly Phil, Tema Sikama, his arms wide. Another mysterious John who has joined us, but hasn't actually told me I could say his name on here. So Mysterious John. An alien from somewhere. Also, yogurt-blooded Matt Greek. Greek yogurt. Matt Greek yogurt-blooded Matt Greek. <laughs> <laughs> the sentence is hard. It's got off the rails. <laughs> oh, boy. And our Kobe FF Joe Ruppel. Sexy hypersleep underpants Elad Avron. The large jerk and gun superhero. Tinge Barker of Game Science Podcast. Adrian Falcone of this podcast sometimes. John, champion of chest-bursting beavers. DJ Detachable Egg Sack Moffat. It's gross. And my mom <laughs> and Grandma Judy and Magical Corporate Space Unicorn Jolene Creighton. Don't trust her. She's going to smuggle aliens in you. And she might be full Watch of milk. Out. <laughs> <laughs> A pinata unicorn now. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Josh, again for that as well as being on. It was a real treat. You can also help support the show by going to decipherside.com or rather telling people you think would like our show to go there because you've already been there. Presumably. If you go there soon, it'll be much better because new website. Working on that. Was that a secret? I wonder for the listeners that aren't supporters. But yeah, we got a whole lot going on back there because new shows, etc. Also, maybe a surprise to you. Surprise. And uh, that's the end. Josh, you're awesome. Colbert, you're awesome. Aliens is awesome. Somebody tell John Cameron he's awesome. John. Somebody tell James Cameron he's awesome. We, I call him John because he's my good personal friend, though. <laughs> yeah, it's my nickname from my friend John. <laughs> I mean, James. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're his actual friend, you know he wants to be called John. <laughs> ah, I'm, just bra- I'm just busting his chops because we're close like that. And that's it. We're done. Watch out for overpositors.
Yeah, everyone's going to have prostate problems today. I'll tell you what. 